Sign up to The Economist for in-depth curated expert analysis of world events and topics ranging from business and culture to science and technology. You'll get the weekly digital edition, online-only articles, curated newsletters on politics, the markets, science, culture and China, and full access to The Economist Podcast Plus. The Economist is independent journalism for independent thinking. Go to economist.com and get your first month free. Today on CityCast Chicago, CPS releases its school-by-school budget, what's next for Cook County's Juvenile Detention Center, and we've got more things to do in June. Joining me to break it all down from Injustice Watch Kelly Garcia and Chicago Sun-Times education reporter Nader Issa. It's Friday, May 31st. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago is talking about. Before we jump into the conversation, this weekend is the 1st of June. We did a little guide earlier this week, but obviously there is just so much. This weekend alone, we got the 57th Street Art Fair in Hyde Park, Do Division Street Fest in West Town, Hot Dog Fest in Portage Park, and there's so many other things to list. But I want to start by asking y'all, what's something you're looking forward to, if not this weekend, but at some point in June? Kelly, I'm going to start with you. What's something you're excited for? I'm looking forward to the Puerto Rican Festival. I haven't been since before the pandemic, and I remember there being a lot of good food and good artists, good music. Um, It's also like one of the few affordable music festivals nowadays, so I'm really excited for that. Agreed. I love the way the parade just sort of flows into it. And I've been out there. It has been, I want to say, I didn't go last year, but I went the year before. It is one of the most energetic street festivals in Chicago, one of the most well attended and energized parades in the city. It really feels directly connected to the neighborhood. And so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, Nader, what, what about you? What's something you are looking forward to, whether it's this first week in June or later on in the month? Well, definitely a Puerto Rican fest because I'm going to be able to just walk up the street from my place <laughs> and go enjoy it all about two blocks away. So that's going to be fun. And then the second one, I think it's the most obvious one. And I was surprised it wasn't on your guide. because I I mean, I think everyone in Chicago is looking forward to it, which is my birthday. And it's just (laughs) going to be citywide celebrations. Um, I just I mean, talk about energy. It's 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 I I don't know. I just think everyone's looking forward to it. Everyone I've talked to has (laughs) has uh, been talking about it for weeks. And so that's what that's what's on my radar for this month. What day uh, is your birthday? It's the 27th, so we've got a we've got a full month to go, uh, but the excitement's just building throughout the city. Hey, we want to give you an early happy birthday. I, hopefully it is a, a street festival and a celebration uh, in your household. Uh, if people are looking for things to do across the city, one of the best places to go is our website, chicago.citycast.fm. We got a packed events calendar. We're going to do a full themed week on street festivals in the city. The best places to go, the best food to eat, but also asking straight up, why does Chicago have so many? So stay in tune for that as well. Every Friday, we like to look back on some of the stories that were taking place across the city. Uh, Nate, I want to start with you. Uh, Chicago Public Schools has uh, a new budgeting formula, and this week they released their school to school budget. I've I've looked at a a, a few different articles here, and I I have to ask you, is this something I should be worried about? Because it seems um, that while there is a push to address uh, the the schools with the, the highest amount of need and get them more uh, sustainable uh, and equitable resources. You know, a lot of headlines are pointing to, you know, some places going to be losing after school, going to be losing staff positions. So can you break down this story for us? Yeah, and it, it's a bit of a complicated one uh, because of things in Chicago at CPS, also because of things at the state level in Springfield. And so, I mean, anyone who's followed CPS, followed education in Chicago, you've heard about something called student-based budgeting, which is CPS gives money to schools based on the number of students they have. There's like a set dollar amount. That started in 2013, 2014, after the the historic uh, closings of 50 schools in Chicago. And what it did, it was started to contribute to the cycle of 
schools were losing students for reasons outside of their factors, community reasons, neighborhood reasons. And so when they lost students, they would then lose more funding, which would mean they would have to get rid of programs. And then it made the schools less attractive and they'd lose more students. And it was this sort of downward spiral. CPS over the past about five years has, has tried to get away from that a little bit. They've tried to give more money, like smaller grants to small schools that are losing students and give some money to schools that are facing um, hardship factors like high poverty rates, uh, a lot of students who are unhoused, a lot of students learning English. What the district's trying to do this year, and this is obviously something that Brandon Johnson has long called for, the CTU has long called for, they're trying to shift the entire model for how CPS funds schools to put those what, hardship factors first and enrollment second. So schools, based on um, all of these factors that we talked about, they're going to get more money, the more hardship their students face. And then, yeah, enrollment will be considered second if, if you need more for more kids. But it is a bit contentious because there are some schools that are losing resources and they're facing cuts. And the CPS CEO, Pedro Martinez, told us the trend that the district has seen is that the schools that are facing some cuts are um, places with, lo with really low poverty, for example. But it, it, our analysis has, has shown that there are some schools where it doesn't totally make sense that they're losing, they're losing staff. Um, they don't have a super low poverty rate. They do have a lot of immigrant families, for example, who need language resources. And uh, so it's, it's sort of a difficult situation. I think the most influential factor here is that CPS isn't fully funded. And this is what the district advocated for at the state level. They, they are advocating for more funding. The state's own uh, estimate is that CPS is only funded around 80% of the money that it needs to adequately serve its students. And so they're asking for more, especially with the district facing a deficit. And we learned this week that Springfield in the budget that the state legislature passed does not add more funding for K-12 education. Yeah, when we were talking about the sort of joint effort between CTU and CPS to go down to Springfield, lobby the governor for more money, we didn't expect for lawmakers to turn in that money. And so in many ways, this was a collaborative effort so that the public, as this day is now here, where we're learning about staff cuts, when uh, 150 Chicago public schools will, will have fewer staff positions next year, according to some estimates, you know, 120 public schools stand to lose vital after school programs. It feels like this news is now we're supposed we're expected to now point that frustration at lawmakers down to Springfield and say, hey, this is why we need more money, because for some of the schools, they might be able to use private donations. Right. Some of the families that go there, the, the community support um, to provide those gaps. Uh, but but what are the potential actions that can be taken by principals at schools who might want to like, is there recourse there where they can, uh, you know, say, Hey, we, we want to dispute this. We actually think we deserve more, more, more money against what this formula says. Yeah. So there's been an appeals process. Principals got their budgets in March and they've been reviewing them with their local school councils. If they felt that they, that they were losing too much, they were able to go back to CPS and appeal. I think it's important to note um, we haven't really been able to fact check this yet because of the way that CPS changed its uh, funding formula. It's, it's just difficult to know for certain right now. But CPS is saying that they're not going to be spending any less overall at schools than, last, than this current year. Mm -hmm. And they have a $391 million deficit. They're saying they're going to fill that deficit with cuts entirely in central office contracts, that sort of thing. But as far as schools and their recourse, there, there's not really much they can do. And that's the difficult part, because even the schools, like even if there is a low poverty rate, students still need a good education. And I don't think anyone would say that those schools should have less resources. It's just the schools that have more needs should have more resources than they currently have. And that's where it comes in with the underfunding and 
you mentioned the after school programs. That's another issue at the state level. They overspent a federal grant meant for after school programs. And so that money is running out early. And there are 120 schools in CPS where after school programs that usually run and they serve about 15,000 students, they're not going to be able to run this summer or next year because of the loss of that funding. What is the district saying about how, you know, potential teachers and staff members, like what are their options, right? They're hearing this in May, school is going to end in June. Like how are folks on the ground being notified um, of, of what their future looks like? Well, a lot of them, as as the principals got these budgets and LLCs vote on them, they'll sort of get an idea. OK, I mean, you can sort of read in the budget. My position is not budgeted for next year. I'm probably not going to be here. And so a, a lot of staff members will get start to get those notices. The system for going to a different school isn't really smooth. A lot of teachers and staff every year basically get laid off and then they have to reapply to get positions in different schools. That's a really contentious issue. The Chicago Teachers Union doesn't like how that system works. But basically from now through the start of the school year, staff will sort of have to look to see which other schools might have a position that they want. And then they can uh, they can try to go there for next fall. And CPS said around 80 percent of staff who are displaced from their schools because of budgetary reasons end up going to another school in the district. To learn more, head to our show notes where we'll have articles not only from Nader and his colleagues, but also from folks at places like Chalkbeat Chicago. Kelly, you just released a report as Cook County announced plans to replace their juvenile detention center with smaller centers of care. Um, I mean, this has been in the making as we've seen populations uh, shrinking. What's behind this plan? What's motivating? And also, uh, how much faith do you have in Cook County to be able to, you know, uh, effectively follow through? Yeah, so you're right. This this idea of replacing the this large facility uh, in, with with smaller community-based facilities has been around for a long time. Advocates, um, people inside have long pushed for that to happen, um, but this is the first time that we're seeing the county actually act on that. Uh, so a couple months ago, the chief judge announced that the county was moving forward with plans to replace the five-story facility on the west side um, with smaller facilities throughout the city. And that's thanks to a grant that the county got from the federal government. Cook County is one of 26 counties across the country that's going to do this. Um, and we're by far the largest to do this. So what exactly they were planning to do was actually not public information um, until we were able to get the proposal through a FOIA request. Um, what this proposal shows us is that the county is planning to essentially downsize the juvenile detention center as it exists right now um, into more dormitory style uh, facilities. Um, they expect less than 50 kids to remain at the facility, um, but they expect the, the remaining to go to these centers of care, as you said, um, which will provide more rehabilitative services um, and programs for kids experiencing trauma to actually heal from. Do you have a sense of what that looks like? Because a center for care is like, like it reads nice in an article, but when we're talking about the criminal legal system, you've looked into the investigations into Cook County's Juvenile Detention Center, which is already a supposed to be a rehabilitative space, a center for care, essentially, for for young people who are in the care of the state. And, and we have decade history, a long history of inhumane uh, conditions. And so so what does it mean for them to be using this language, a center for care? The centers of care right now, from what we know, that's really just what they're calling it. Um, these centers of care are expected to be semi-secure facilities. So um, the doors aren't necessarily going to be locked, but there's going to be protocols in place for the kids inside to not be able to leave. There's going to be outside activities, but it's not clear exactly what those activities will look like, who will be in charge. Um, what we do know is that for this first year, they are going to um, partner with community organizations to operate those centers of care. Um, and I and I don't remember if I mentioned this earlier as well, but uh, as part of this plan, something that they are also, they're also going to create are assessment centers. So they're essentially splitting this 
JTDC, the Juvenile Detention Center, into assessment centers and centers of care. The assessment centers will operate as like the, the screening process uh, where they will look at a variety of risk factors, whether a kid should be sent to the juvenile detention center, or they should be sent to a center of care, or they should be released. Um, and then after that, if they decide, if the judge decides that the kid needs to be sent to a center of care, um, they will be sent to one, uh, presumably one that's closest to wherever that kid is from, so they can be close to their community, to their home. Um, but from what we know right now, the juvenile detention center is still going to exist. It's just going to be in a sm much smaller capacity. Mm -hmm. For someone like yourself who has looked through these investigations, who has covered the state of facilities, not only in Cook County, but across Illinois. I mean, this feels like a, a reform effort, sort of in acknowledging the inhumane conditions of uh, Cook County's uh, juvenile detention center and, and opting for something different. Is that a fair characterization in your reporting? So honestly, I think that we don't have enough information to say because as of right now, they don't know who's going to lead these centers. They couldn't even give me a, a, a dollar amount for how much it's going to cost to actually build and operate these centers of care, these new assessment centers. I, I do think, though, that um, what this proposal and, and what this, this effort is doing is forcing county officials, especially the current leadership at the GTDC, to admit that the current facility is not it does not actually provide the kind of support that the kids inside need. Um, they can admit that, you know, right now it's, it's not rehabilitative. But again, a lot of advocates are skeptical. It's not clear if the current le leadership at the GTDC, which has been historically resistant to a lot of the, the recommendations, a lot of the criticism about what's been going on inside, a lot of that around, you know, room confinement, disciplinary practices, um, inappropriate strip searches, lack of special education services, because there is still a school inside. Um, a lot of that has has gone unaddressed and it's still going unaddressed. Yeah, I would. I imagine uh, it's not just me who feels that, you know, when we start using words like assessment centers and care centers, we're just now we're talking semantics. We're just using we're putting nicer words on top of a, a still a situation of a, a carceral system where people are going to be, uh, whether it's at the, the current location or at these other sites, still being inside of the punitive system, still being confined to a, a care center, uh, a juvenile detention center. Those uh, feel like we're just using different names here. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big question we have is what's going to be different about these centers of cares? Um, who's going to lead them? Is this going to be, you know, one of the concerns that uh, the workers, the, the labor union representing the workers inside had was, are we essentially just going to privatize the juvenile detention center? Are we going to outsource a lot of the programs and services that are being offered right now at the juvenile detention center with private um, organizations? So uh, there's definitely a lot of concern. Um, advocates think this is just going to be, you know, some of the same stuff that we're seeing now, just smaller jails. I do want to stay on this conversation around shrinking, closing, moving away from prisons because Governor J.B. Pritzker announced last March a $900 million plan over the next five years to knock down Stateville Correction Center, a maximum security men's facility just outside of Joliet and the Women's Logan Correctional Center in Lincoln, uh, which is located 30 miles north of Springfield. Now, some people might have saw that and just sort of maybe clicked out at the the closing of those two facilities. But the plan is to essentially rebuild them in some capacity stateville at the same location and they're still sort of figuring out the details around logan uh kelly the chicago reader published a piece earlier this week that essentially asked why and who are we building uh these prisons for yeah uh similar to the, to the juvenile detention center we're seeing arrests across the board go down so like debbie Marie brown Post in their stories, why are we spending so much money on facilities when we know that the number of people incarcerated is going down? Um, are there going to be efforts to actually reduce the, the number of people who are incarcerated um, with these plans? Um, so two days ago, as part of that story, two days ago, the, the General Assembly passed the state budget, which included, um, I think, under a billion dollars for um, demolition and rebuilding those those two facilities. Um, and I, I think a lot of people, you know, have mixed feelings about that. Um, it looked like, you know, people who are incarcerated said, you know, there's there was a lot of issues with those facilities inside. There were water leakages. Um, I think at one point there was one person talking about a raccoon falling through the ceiling. Um, so, you know, there's clearly it's long overdue. Right. This 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 uh, idea of 
you know, rebuilding and, and demolishing Stateville. Um, but what's going to happen to those support systems that people have created inside? Um, what's going to happen to the programs that um, have helped people, you know, get degrees? So I'm very curious what's going to happen to to those kinds of organizations that have uh, created those, those uh, connections inside with people. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of money, $900 million to demolish and then rebuild those facilities when we know that the number of people incarcerated is going down. It doesn't make sense. I feel like you brought up a similar point in your coverage earlier this year around detention centers is like prisons is a business and it's often a business and an economic incentive for rural communities. It's like, well, the jobs in this town are built on this. The economic fate of this community is tied in because manufacturing and other forms of of um, sort of economic production in this town have whittled. But as the as the article poses, is that a good reason for us to to be investing in in larger, uh, essentially more more modern prisons as the, as they're painting it? It's not to say that we shouldn't be addressing the inhumane conditions, fixing water leaks, making sure raccoons don't live, making sure people aren't living with fecal matter sort of smeared with with years long history to it. That, that's just sort of gone un, um, unchanged. And so this I, I think this article really points out to people like like what really is the loudest voice at the table when it comes to continuing to invest in large scale criminal legal. And so much of it is how we've our economy is built on the backbone of uh, of it. And, and, and we need to address that versus uh, sort of believing this is the only way to do things. Every single episode of City Cash Chicago ends with some good news. Nader, you are currently sitting in your car on deadline writing. We appreciate you joining us here. What's that good news that is getting you through uh, these long, uh, hardworking days? Well, I think it depends you ask if this is good news or not. But uh, <laughs> there's a bar in the suburbs. This was in a, a sometime story my colleague Embark Cologne wrote uh, that is offering cicada malort shots. And for anyone who has had the beauty of a Malort shot, it's like, what could, what could make it even more beautiful, you know? And it's a cicada, it turns out. And so there's a cicada in the Malort shot. You get to take both. It's a, uh, it's an affordable shot and yeah, you get to enjoy the beautiful Western suburb of Lombard where I grew up. Actually, uh, I was surprised to see that that's where it was. And yeah, there's there's uh, there's some good stuff out there for anyone looking to take an adventure and get a cicada into their system. Noon whistle brewing out Lombard. Like, I feel like if because we did a whole episode on cicada recipes and I feel like in that conversation, it's like you won't get people to get eat cicadas, put it next to something people like. And the idea of drinking Malort is to just like put it next to maybe a good story or put it next to a beer so you can quickly wash it down. And so bringing two things uh, together in this way, I, I don't think creates better. I don't think this is bigger than the sum of its parts. I think they found a way to make both of these things less appealing. Kelly, are you going to be taking a Malort shot this summer uh, or a Cicada Malort shot at that? I think I'll pass. Um I, I'm, you know, I'm, I admire the Midwesterners who are embarking on that journey, but I, I think I, I, you know, I barely struggle to, I can barely take a Miller shot. So I think I'm going to pass on that. And Nader, it is where you grew up and you, you were excited to tell us a story. Is this something you're going to be participating in this summer? If they still have enough cicadas left by my birthday i'll take that my birthday <laughs> all right so they they gotta make it to the to at least the end of june they, to hook you up with the the cicada malor shot all right kelly over to you last weekend it feels like festival season in chicago got started uh with sueños you know the weather was it, it was a mixed bag to say the least but you were actually out there what was your weekend like it was so fun. Yes, day two sucked. I didn't even get in because the weather was just so bad. The doors didn't open till four. But the first day, honestly, it was a great kickoff. Like there was great food, there was great music. Um, 
personally, I prefer Sueños over other music festivals at Grant Park because they have like more benches. It's a little more accessible. I think it's easier for people who maybe can't stand for so long to just kind of sit down and chill. Um, and then also similar to the Puerto Rican festival, I think there's just like a lot of pride. There's a lot of cultural heritage, and I really appreciate a dedicated space uh, for that. So I had a lot of fun uh, the first day at least, and I thought I, I think it's always a great way to start the summer with Sueños. What was the best thing you saw? I personally was a huge fan of Javi. He's like this young rising star in like the Mexican corrido scene. So he brought out like a huge crowd on Saturday. Um, so that was really nice to see just like a lot of support for this young rising star. Well, if people want to see more music, you know, in the loop, sort of Grand Park, Millennium Park, I believe this weekend, the Chicago House Music Festival and Conference uh, is this week. Um Man, I'm just looking at some of the people who are going to be out there. Wayne Williams going to be out there. Farley, Jack Master Funk, Tony Touch. Uh, they also have Gospel Music Festival at Millennium Park uh, this weekend as well on Saturday. And so music is going to continue all summer long in the loop. Again, go to Chicago.CityCast.FM to our events calendar. Uh, but, you know. We'll also drop some link in the show notes for you as well. Uh, with so much to do this weekend, I also want to give people one more event. I am happy to be hosting the 49th edition of Karaoke Storytellers this Sunday at Brando's Speak Easy in the Loop, which is one of Chicago's best karaoke lounges. And in fact, Karaoke Storytellers was largely born out of the people who went to Brando's uh, and folks just wondering, like, what is the story behind these songs? Like, have you ever gone to karaoke and seen somebody like belt out? Uh, ordinary people by John Legend. Sometimes you just wonder, is there a, is there a story in there? Uh, and so that's what we do at Karaoke Storytellers. Tickets are almost sold out, so go to the link in the show notes. Uh, and we also want to hear from you. What are the things you are looking forward to in June? Let us know by leaving us a text or a voicemail at 773-780-0246. I want to give a huge thank you to our guest today from Injustice Watch. Shout out to Kelly Garcia. Kelly, thank you for making time for us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And shout out to Nader Issa from the Chicago Sun-Times reporting live from the car. Nader, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thank you. Before I let you go, I got to give a huge thank you to the people who make CityCast Chicago possible. Our executive producer is Simone Alisea. Our producer is Michelle Navarro. Our Hey Chicago newsletter editor is Sydney Madden. The music we all love is from the homie Sam Thousand, all the kimonos, and Mark Greenberg from the Mayfair Workshop. Hey, if you enjoy the show, please put us on with your friends and family. The best way for people to find the podcast is through word of mouth. Also, if you got some time, leave us a review and a rating wherever you listen. Just something quick like, hey, Kobe, love what you're doing. Keep doing it. If you're new here, please bookmark our website, chicago.citycast.fm, and go through the crates. We got close to 800 published episodes. So again, there's something for everybody in there. And the best thing you could do is be back here bright and early on Monday. We'll talk to you then. Peace.